this is where the, the sap is processed in a maple syrup. This is our sugar house. Uh, this is the evaporator. This is called an intensifier two. It's um, top of the line. This evaporator, it can boil at high fire or it can gasify. So you can basically burn wet wood in it and, and gasify with it. It's not as efficient. Uh, it doesn't make as good a quality syrup. Uh, as, as you do on a high fire. And I run it on high fire because that's what I like, it's high quality syrup. Um, we had this, this is our, our, our third year with it. Uh, the first two years we ran uh, my old pans on this rig and uh, we ran a steam away which sat up on top of the flue pan which basically is sort of like a double boiler. It's like having two flue pans. It uses the energy of the lower pan to, to start the boiling process in the in the uh, in the uh, in the steam pan before it goes into the into the evaporator, and we decided we wanted to have uh, with the regulations that are coming, uh, they want everything to be covered, so we went uh, with new pans this year uh, and we put uh, the uh, the steam hoods on, which keeps everything more much more clean and uh, dirt free and all that. Being that we burn wood, it's it gets a bit dusty. Uh, because of the, the wood. So anyway, uh, the sap uh, comes into um, the milk tanker behind me from the, from the woods from different areas. And um, then from there, this room over here has a, uh, has a swimming pool filter in it. It's basically like your swimming pool filter at your house, runs on D uh, if you've got a swimming pool. And uh, we filter out a lot of the impurities out of the sap. Um, anything that's happened to be in the lines as it, the season goes on, it gets to be kind of like, we call it smegma. It's, it's like a little stringers and things that are in the sap because of the bacteria. It's basically bacteria that's all clung together is what it is and, and it'll grow on a tubing and a lot of times you'll, you won't get a good run and then you'll get a nice freeze and you're getting later into the season and bang, all this stuff will come flying out. So you end up really having to spend a lot of time cleaning up the sap um, to uh, get out that impurity because we're realistically trying to keep our RO uh, machine with as good as sap coming in uh, to, the, to the machine as possible because it takes a lot out of the membranes to have uh, sap that's, that's not uh, it's not clean. Um, it has a lot of bacteria in it. So uh, from the DE room, the sap gets pumped up into another tank. From there, it feeds the RO. When we have enough sap ahead, we like to have between four and 5,000 gallons to boil. Uh, then we'll start the RO. The RO separates uh, water from sugar. And the, the liquid that comes out one side is, is concentrated sugar. And the liquid that comes out the other side is what we is called permeate, which is the water that's in the sap. It's uh, completely pure uh, water, mineral free, and that's what's used after the machine is has done its uh, concentration uh, to rinse the machine. Um, uh, you have to rinse the sugar out of the uh, out of the um, the membranes because they'll uh, they will foul what we call fouling. They actually get. Uh, they get uh, not happy if they don't get cleaned. So anyway, from that point, uh, the sap, uh, the concentrate will come into the evaporator. Um, we start the fire, just like you do in any other evaporator. This one is very high tech. Um, it, you can get hurt badly with it because of the, the blower system in here. It really causes a turbulence and it all has to be shut down when you're, you're firing, otherwise you can basically roast yourself. So um, from that point, we start making syrup. Uh, we have an automatic draw. It's a, called a, this is actually called a modulating valve. Um, and it, it basically is always moving, sensing the heat of, of the syrup. Uh, once we've got our density, um, um, we got our density where we want it of our syrup, we kind of get it, that locked in and then we're good usually for the evening or uh, if, unless the weather changes. Sometimes a storm will come in and it'll change things. So we're, 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 once we're making the syrup, from that point it goes into this, into this stainless um, tank here. When it gets up high enough, I have a pump over here and I pump it into this canner here. There I'll, f I'll finish the density up. I'll, if, if it's off a little bit, we have to mess with that a little bit. Uh, uh, add a little water in 
to uh, get the syrup density where we want it. And then from there, it goes through this, uh, this piece of equipment here, which is called a filter press. And this takes all the impurities out of the, out of the maple syrup so that when it comes out, it's perfectly clear, crystal clear syrup uh, when it's going to go on your pancakes. And everything is packed into stainless steel barrels or plastic. Uh, it's the only thing that touches our syrup, uh, mostly stainless steel. Um, and that's um, pretty much what goes on up here. It's pretty, uh, pretty basic. Um, a lot has changed with the technology more than actually how it's done. You still got to build a fire sooner or later, um, even with all the great technology of osmosis machines and, um, and all these other filter presses. It was all done years ago with, with um, old wool felt filters. Um, and before that, they had what were called settling tanks, where you'd actually put the syrup into a tank and let all the garbage float to the bottom. <laughs> it would just settle out on the bottom, so hence settling tanks. And they had a draft about three inches off the bottom, and then you take your syrup off of there. It wasn't perfect, but it was a heck of a lot better than what came off the evaporator. So um, the filtering pr 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 um, technology is phenomenal compared to what we had even 10 years ago. Uh, the filter presses are better. The uh, papers we use are better, uh, stronger, and uh, a lot of the presses have gone to an air-operated pump versus a gear-driven pump. Um, so it's, uh, it's a pure, uh, less chance. Uh, some of the old pumps had lead in them. Uh, now they're, these pumps are mostly all plastic uh, diaphragm pumps. So uh, everything that touches the syrup is, uh, is pure. Um, and it's, you don't get any additives that way. So Keith, what do you think led to the first maple syrup being produced in North America? Uh, I'm not really sure why, why, why it got going. Uh, I know it was learned by, from the Indians. The settlers learned it from the Indians. Um, and um, certainly it was a, a, big, a big product back, in, uh, back during the Civil War because we were unable to get our sugar from the South, from sugar cane. So maple was a very important, um, important crop at that time. Okay. And how did European immigrants change the maple syrup making process, do you think, once they got arrived? In once, yes. Once, um, once they started using the kettle system, which was a, basically a, um, uh, they, they put the sap in a kettle over a fire. And then um, as it progressed, they actually got, got uh, even more smarter. They had series of kettles, and they'd ladle it from one kettle to the other as it got more and more concentrated. Um, they went away from the dropping the hot rocks into the sap, which just seems like a very good idea to me. But anyway, it worked, I guess. Um, and then as commercial evaporators started being, being produced at the end of the 18, uh, 1800s, um, that's what really got the maple industry going into a, more of a commercial um, type uh, operation. Not like what we see today, but on most farms, sugared. It was it was uh, something to get a little cash for the for the farmer, um, and uh, also uh, um, it was not much to do that time of the year when everything was all muddy. So that's what they did. They got their own stuff plus they had a little to sell. Great. And when did your family begin to produce maple syrup here in Williamsburg? Uh, in Williamsburg, we started in 1981. Uh, we we actually started doing some. Uh, stuff before that, um, when I was a child, uh, I, we, my father and I, we had a little backyard thing we were doing, but we bought our first evaporator uh, then and built our first sugar house. Um, and an awful lot's changed since then. Um, yeah. And what led to your family getting involved with maple syrup production originally? Um, and well, my great grandfather sugared in Quebec, and um, they moved uh, to Hawley. Uh, Massachusetts and my grandfather um, worked in the mills in Holyoke and he bought uh, the farm up in Holly and they sugared there right up until uh, World War II and my father went into service and the, the farm pretty much fell apart um, at that point and they, they ceased production uh, there and then my father bought this place uh, where we are now and then we bought this piece of land where the sugar bush is, and by happenstance, didn't even know it had maple on it. <laughs> so it was kind of a kind of a strange thing. We went walking around out in those woods, and and uh, it didn't take us long. 
we decided we were going to start making syrup. So, um, and my father was a very big part of that um, for a good part of of this the first first twenty years that we we ran here. Um, he was a big part of it. Uh, he's just eighty nine now, so he doesn't get around like he used to. So it's uh, he's not not involved with it anymore. Mm -hmm. And how did your, you said your grandfather started right. the original business? Yes. So who, how did he learn how to um, All the farmers around in, in Hawley all sugared, and he picked it up from the Scots sugared, um, the, um, the houses sugared. Every, every small farm up there had a, had a sugaring operation, and he said, well, geez, if they're doing it, why can't I? Uh -huh. um, and like I said, he did it with my grandfather in Quebec, so he, he had some experience uh, at, at it, but uh, he, he really went full blast and they had horses, he did it all by hand, all buckets um, and uh, he sold uh, a great deal of his syrup, went back to the Vermont Vaporator Company because at that time when he bought a piece of equipment they were quite happy to take your syrup for almost no money mm -hmm. and he figured he'd probably be dead of old age before he ever um, you know, would pay that evaporator off, and my my uh, my um, um, great aunt had a uh, a store at a worked in a in a plumbing store, so she said, "Well, why don't we put it at the plumbing store?" So he started canning it up, putting it in the plumbing store, and she'd sell his crop every year for him. <laughs> so he got his money back a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so did the process back then? Uh, has it changed a lot? Oh yeah, it's, so it's your modern operation. Yeah, like night and day, completely. Everything's automated. Um, you know, we have the uh, the onset of the uh, of the vacuum came into play. Uh, actually, that's been around since the since the mid '60s. It's been tremendously perfected mm -hmm. today compared to what 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 was out there in them days. It was very crude. It were basically old dairy pumps. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, also the uh, you know the onset of the of the uh, osmosis machine has tremendously saved labor uh, and time. Uh, the tubing versus buckets, you can set all this. All you have to do at sugaring time is tap your trees. You don't have to be out there gathering in the woods. Um, this particular farm here set 3,500 buckets, so they had 10 crews with horses that would that would gather this this hillside. But it, and the other problem today is there's no you can't find a labor force. In them days, every farm had a team of horses or oxen or whatever, and they would they would you know um, pitch in at sugar in time. They they get it was something to do with the teams. They made some money. They got a little syrup or whatever. However, they bartered it out. So it's uh, yeah, a tremendous amount has changed in this business. Mm -hmm. It's uh, constantly changing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what is, for those. Uh, viewers and, and listeners who don't have experience with maple sugaring, what's a vacuum? It's uh, it's it's uh, um, it's a pump that pulls vacuum like uh, basically like a, a home vacuum cleaner, mm -hmm. only a lot bigger. Uh, some run uh, with an oil cooling system. Some I got one that runs on oil. I have one that runs on water. It's cooled with water, but it also the the uh, the either the oil or the water uh, is what seals the pump and which creates the vacuum. Um, and it's, it's, uh, our, I, we have one pump that runs at, uh, 28 inches of mercury vacuum. Uh, the most you can ever get is 30 and that's at sea level. The higher the altitude, the higher it is, harder it is to achieve, uh, vac high vacuum, mm -hmm. um, because of the atmosphere, fair pressure differences from the, from the, the height of the altitude. So the guys in, way up in the mountains in Vermont have a, a hard time achieving high vacuum, um, because of that. So actually, they do better in Canada because it, it, uh, out the uh, sea level above sea level is, is isn't as much as it is in some of the peaks in Vermont, mm -hmm. uh, Maine, uh, same way. Um, yep. Okay. And what does your particular maple syrup production process involve? From can you describe the process from start to finish? Start to finish. Uh, well, we have to tap the trees, and when it's warm enough, uh, we've got to run. And sometimes it takes me a couple days to get enough to, to be able to, uh, to have enough to boil. Um, we have to have enough to be able to run through the osmosis machine so we have enough permeate, which is the water that comes out of the sap, to wash the machine um, later in the day. And so, how do you tap the trees? 
What's, what's uh, the we, process? We tap all by, all by hand uh, with, uh, with a cordless electric drill. Mm -hmm. Each tree gets a, a hole or two, depending on the size of the tree. We don't tap any more than two, two taps per tree, no matter how big it is. Uh, with the vacuum, that's another thing. It, it's uh, is tremendously saved on a tree, uh, tree uh, life, and and its ability to heal itself because we're using a lot less taps than we did under under a gravity system mm -hmm. with the vacuum. Um, you're actually shooting yourself in the foot if you you put too many holes in the tree. You're not really gaining much. Mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, that we start with the tapping process. So how do you determine one tap versus two? The size of the tree. So if it's over, we we tap a down as size. small as is seven inches because we use a five sixteenths tap, mm -hmm. um, and I find them they're they're about like teenagers. They respond very well to it. They heal very quickly. They produce a lot of sap. It's not as sweet as the big trees, um, but uh, we've had very good luck tapping the small trees. Uh, that started in '99 once the the what's called the health tap was created. Um, it's a very small, it was a very small 1964, which is just a little smaller than 5 sixteenths. Um, when that came on, on board, that made uh, the ability to tap a lot smaller trees. Um, because before that, we were using 7 sixteenths, which is a pretty big hole. And you do that on a 6-inch six, six tree, it isn't going to be around long. You're going to run out of places to, to, to tap because it just, the circumference of the tree just isn't there. Yeah. Well, I've heard about... I guess up in Vermont or UVM came out with a tap that doesn't allow backflow. Yeah, so it's it, called a check valve uh, ball valve tap. I'm not too impressed with it. We tried uh -huh. 200 of them. I, I wasn't impressed with them at all. They claim they redesigned them. Um, the other thing, I don't like plastic in my tree. We use stainless steel taps. Um, plastic, black plastic is a heat sink. And I've proven this is because a simple reason it's black, it attracts the heat from the sun. You go out there on a 50 degree day and touch that tap and it's warm on a tree. That's, that's a bad recipe. And the stainless taps are ice cold on, on a warm day. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, a, a big, big change. We've found since we've used the stainless tax, taps, we've, we've, we've always gotten better production over all of our, na around our, our surrounding sugarers around us. So I'm very pleased with the outcome with those. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you tap and then you have tubing going from tree to tree? Tree to tree. Yep. Uh, we only run six taps uh, and then they go into what's called a multi-fitting. It's, a, it's a, actually a saddle that goes on to the main line. Um, so we go no more than six taps into the main line. Then the main lines feed into what to call a trunk line, which is a big line. Uh, they're usually, most of mine are inch and a half. And then from there, it goes to the, uh, the vacuum releaser. And the, the releaser uh, it pulls, va pulls vacuum from the pump to the releaser. And when it gets uh, uh, enough sap in it, it has a float system in there and it'll, it'll trip off. Some people use what's called a positive vacuum system where they, ha they actually pump the sap through the releaser. So they have vacuum constantly. Um, I don't have electricity in some of my areas, so we have to use what's called a manual type releaser. It actually shuttles the vacuum from one tank to the other and uh, allows it to be able to dump the sap once, once the, uh, the releasers come to proper level. Okay. And how do you know when to start tapping trees in the spring? Well, I, I always said I, I never know when to, uh, when to tap, but I always know when to finish the end of the year because the weather takes over and that's the end. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's um, I would say over the 30 years I've done it, I've, I've hit it right half the time. So it's about a 50-50. This year I'm feeling pretty confident I did the right thing. We, we, we nailed them, started, started tapping the 3rd of February, which is really early. I never tapped that early, but I saw the weather pattern, the way the winter's been. It's been up and down all winter. It hasn't ever locked down cold. Um, so I said, you know what, we're going to start. We're gonna, we got, well, all we're going to do is screw up. That's the worst we can do. But we've, uh, we've gotten in um, better than a third of our crop now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we've made very nice syrup, very high quality. So I'm very, very happy with the decision. I think we made the right decision. But I won't know till April if I really made the right decision or not. I might have mm -hmm. said, boy, maybe I should have started a little earlier. Y you don't know. It's a gamble. 
it's a gut. But is, but is it? It's possible to start too early. It is. You can you can hurt happens? yourself by I've I've seen it happen. It's not so bad now because we have sterile drop lines, sterile taps every single year. So it's not as detrimental as years ago when you were sticking a dirty old tap into a tree, and we didn't know any different. We always knew that we'd put a a new sugar bush together and run like crazy that first year. It was amazing, and everybody says, "Oh, that's because there those trees have never been tapped before." And that was nonsense it's because of the, the microbes in the in the in the, uh, in the sap, in the, in getting into the tubing, and it, it it's detrimental. It it actually grows bacteria right in that tap hole. So if you tap too soon, and let's say you're froze up for three or four weeks, and you, before you see another run, all that mi microbial growth is going on in that tap hole. It's a, it's it's just like um, anything. It's bacteria takes over. And it will close those tap holes up. It'll it'll dry them up, and then you're you've lost out. You tap too late. Well, you might not get the freeze thaw cycle going. It may just warm up and stay warm. And without the freezing at night, um, your production's not going to be there. Even with vacuum, it's a big help, but it's you got to have that freezing. Okay. And how do you judge when to boil? I boil when that? we have enough sap. How much is enough? I usually need about four to five thousand gallons in a day to, to, to be worthwhile boiling it. Um, only because of having to wash the RO machine down. Mm -hmm. And what affects sap yield from year to year? Can be weather. Um, uh, this past season we had um, we had a, a, a awful lot of seed. The trees seeded very heavily. This the most I've ever seen ever. Uh, in all the years I've sugared, um, but I attribute that to the year before when we had a very bad drought. It always triggers a seed crop. The trees say, oh, we got to make little baby trees because we may not be here. It's a, it's a nature thing that goes on. Generally, and I've seen it this year, what happens is your sugar content in the sap is less when you've had uh, a big seed crop. Uh, what I found this year, which is very bizarre, is that maybe only 10% of the seeds actually um, e ever had any, anything in them. They were just empty hulls. Um, never seen anything like it. All the years I've, I've sugared that the seeds wouldn't be, wouldn't have, have the, uh, the, the internals mm -hmm. in them. They're just empty hulls. Very strange. Yeah. And... So how many? So you said you tap thirty five hundred trees. Is that We're setting close to eight thousand taps here. Oh, eight thousand. Okay, and how has that changed over the last several years? Yeah, we started out with uh, when we first started. We started out with buckets. We we hung three hundred buckets, and um, I was not too happy with buckets. So we we went to tubing and that following year we went we had 550 taps on tubing. We made 110 gallons of syrup. Um, so we had a, a quite a huge difference in, in, in the crop yield also. The 600 buckets or 300 buckets uh, rather gave us uh, 30 gallons of syrup that year. That's all we got was 30 gallons. So yes we set more taps but with the tubing our yield was higher. Um, and you know, from there we've grown. We we we've added um, the the um, a, a whole section of land up top that I, I logged off and I, I got got the permission from the guy and we uh, we've had a very good relationship. It's changed hands a couple of times and when it did the last time, I ended up getting the whole other side of the mountain. Uh, the guy that, that was in there, they didn't want him there anymore, so they offered it to me and I said sure. And that's when we really made a big expansion here. We really started to to go at this. Um, a lot more uh, seriously, and in, in uh, 90, God, I'm trying to think here, 94, I lost my job. So I made a decision then that I was never going to have that happen again. I was going to work for me, and we expanded even even further. Um, found more sugar, sugar bushes, uh, and so that's where we've grown to where we are today. And with my wife on board, she's done a lot with the marketing, and we we make a living. It's not a not a, a big living, but we, we have a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the number of trees that you tap is really just, I mean, the sky's the limit as long as you can uh, keep I've grown as big as I'm going to. 
Um, this is the maximum. Yeah, it's for me. It's the maximum. I, mm -hmm. Yes, I could, you know, have three or four more sugar bushes, but trying to find help to help you to do some of the work you have to do. Um, I'm not getting any younger. I'm 51 years old, so I'm not moving around like I used to. So um, I've slowed down, and and I, we're at a comfortable spot, and we're going to stay where we are and and stay to the size that we are, um, and um, our markets are good, and everything's pretty stable. So. We're, we're grown as much as we're gonna. Mm -hmm. So what do you enjoy about the process of making maple syrup? The, the thing I like the most is the work in the forest. Um, I, I like to boil sap, but I, I enjoy the, the, um, the work in the woods. Uh, I also enjoy the interaction with customers. Mm -hmm. And it's always nice to, to talk to someone that's from California or who knows where that uh, either saw your syrup somewhere at a restaurant that we, take, it, it, we have uh, that we're selling syrup to or, or a friend. Uh, we do wedding favors and there'll be people go to the wedding and they'll call you up and say, hey, I want some of that syrup. That was awful good. And my daughter's getting married. Can we have that? And it's, it's, it's amazing meeting different people from different parts of the, of the world, actually. We get people who come here from, from foreign countries even and buy our syrup. So it's, it's very interesting to talk to them and learn about their, their culture a little bit too. And they, they pick my brain at the same time, so it's, it's interesting. I, I enjoy that. Mm -hmm. So or, are you saying you have a, do you have a mail order business? Where you mail? We do mostly on the web. Uh, oh, so. Yes, we, okay. we ship all over the world mm -hmm. uh, to anybody who wants it, mostly in the United States. Uh, we, have, we do some with the servicemen uh, that, that'll, that'll order, and uh, we ship all that to the, to the APOs mm -hmm. for them. And uh, that's, that's a, a very small part of what we do. Most of what we do is, um, is restaurants. And what is the most challenging aspect of maple syrup production? The weather. Um, you never know what you're going to get. And it's different every year. Every single season is different. There's never, uh, I've never seen one that's the same. They, that's what keeps it interesting. Uh, I'm a person that gets bored with things very quickly, but Mother Nature is, is quite an interesting person to try to keep up with. <laughs> I find that. Mm -hmm. A challenge. Mm. And how many gallons of sap does it take to produce one gallon? It of varies from year to year, just like the seasons vary. It um, it it uh, it all, all depends on. Well, gee, how much rain did we get last summer? Did we get a lot of nice sunny days in the spring? The first six weeks from the time that that leaf opens up fully until uh, from that point, you got six weeks. That's when the tree makes all its sugar for the following season. And if you got, like we had last year, with damp, crappy days, raining, no sunshine, uh, it, it's detrimental to the sugar production of the tree. So that always changes every year. And how many gallons of maple syrup do you produce from year to year? How does that, that fluctuate? That varies as widely. Last mm -hmm. year was our biggest crop ever. We made 2,500 gallons of syrup. This year, we're, we're going to, by this weekend, we'll be over 1,000 gallons. So that'll give you a pretty good perspective of where we're at compared to last year. Mm -hmm. uh, before last year, 08 was our best season. And at that point, we, um, we were, uh, I think that year we got pretty close to 2,000 gallons. So last year was my best crop ever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it varies from year to year. Mm -hmm. soil, soil differences, um, you know how much that tree got out of, out of its out of its atmosphere each year, and then how much how kind of, what kind of sugar and weather do you have each each season varies widely. Mm -hmm. It could be too cold, it could be too warm, um, or it could be just right. Um, storms coming in, uh, low pressure, high pressure. When when it, when you're making the the the, uh, the stop is running, it has a lot to do with how much production you get each year. And how is the price of maple syrup determined? Um, you can ask as much as you want for it, but um, will you sell it? Uh, it's very market driven. Uh, Canada, Canada pretty much runs the show as far as setting the, the world price of maple syrup in, a, in, a bulk, in, a, uh, in bulk by the barrel. It's really sold by the pound, all syrup sold by the pound. And what happens is, is, is the Federation sets the price and the United States gets a lot of syrup dumped on them. 
Um, in 08, we were thankful to be dumped on because it was a very poor crop in the United States. Even though we personally had a good crop, um, it, was a, it was a poor crop uh, in the maple industry. Uh, much north of Putney, they, they didn't get much of a crop. The snows were so deep in Maine that um, they use excavators to dig out the, the, uh, the, the uh, sh sugar houses. And they got very little production. By the time the sap started to run, it was, it was over. The, the depths of the snow was phenomenal. Canada was basically in the same boat. They were lucky if they made a pound, uh, a pound per tap. Um, uh, it, it, was, it was very, very, very poor uh, production um, that year. So it does, it does uh, there's times when you're thankful you have it so you can buy it, and there's times that you don't want it, depending on how your market's going also. Mm -hmm. And you were saying you're able to earn enough money to make a living with just your we we do uh, it, we, we've diversified a lot we're not just making syrup i sold most of my syrup before my i, I met my wife by the barrel now uh, we did people stopped here we sold you know packaged syrup but i wasn't out i didn't know how to market myself didn't know where to go to um to sell it and, uh, of course, the onset of the computer and the websites and all that make a huge, huge, it's a marketing tool that we didn't have when I started sugaring. It, was, it didn't exist uh, for the average guy. So that's, uh, that's been a lot. My wife's taken mar marketing courses and things, and it's, it's helped us mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to get into a better place. Mm -hmm. And what percentage of maple syrup containers do you think get recycled? between the glass and the plastic? I think a pretty high amount uh, be, to be my, would be my guess. It's a very recyclable product. Uh, glass obviously is easy. Plastic, they're, all, our, all our containers are recyclable that we use. Um, actually some of the produ small producers recycle them themselves because they come here and they buy caps instead of buying new containers. Um, I don't believe in that. Uh, you know, maybe uh, in a family it's fine. I don't know. I, I, Personally, I, I know enough about everything and how, where was that jug when you got it emptied out? It was in a clean, dry place, you know, and that's, I really push people to buy new, new containers. You're, you're better off. It's safer for everything, everybody. All it takes is one mistake, and we all know how it is now. One mistake, and first you know the media gets it, and it's, it's, a, a, it's a, a huge deal like the lead issue was years ago. It was one guy that was doing a real bad thing, and it, it gave us all a black eye for a while. It took a while to come back from that. Oh, what happened with, I didn't, never heard that story. The, the, there was a huge problem with lead. What happened, the guy was, uh, he was in Vermont. He was making maple syrup in the spring, but in the off season, in the fall, he made apple jelly. Oh, apple jelly is acidic. He had an old lead soldered evaporator. So what it did is it exposed the lead. So his syrup was around 15, I'm, I'm going to say it was 1,500 parts per billion. It was off the charts. Mm. The government standard is, I believe, 200 parts per billion. Okay. Um, so the state was checking everybody's sugar house. It was a circus. Mm -hmm. um, we came in really good at, at first. We were, I think we came in around 100 parts per billion, and that's before we got rid of all our galvanized storage tanks. Mm -hmm. Um, and we got a new evaporator, all welded. And the last time we were checked, we were down to like 20 parts per billion. The guy said, I won't see you again. He says, you're, you're in a really, really good place. He says, you're so far down on the charts. Mm -hmm. So it made me feel pretty good because a can of beans is somewhere around 80 parts per billion. Mm -hmm. So it's in the soil. I think what we're getting now is, is what we're getting from the, what the tree's picking up right out of the soil. And mm -hmm. there's nothing can be helped with that. Um, so you even at even at I believe it's even at 200 parts per billion, uh, which is the the borderline. You'd have to eat like 10 gallons of syrup a month to have a problem. Mm -hmm. So I'm not too worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> and do you think any chemicals are being leached out of the plastic tubing or out of the? Well, actually, that's one question: out of the plastic tubing, but then out of the plastic containers into the syrup. No, Are those? Um, it's all food grade. Uh, okay. All the tubing is food grade, uh, food grade plastic. It has to be uh, USDA approved. So what does approved. that mean exactly? I, I mean, I don't whatever their chemical what makeup means. is, is it, it, it can't leach anything out. 
Okay. Um, there was, I know there's been a lot of problems with people storing their sap in trash cans. Um, just to, just to, you know, small backyard guys. And uh, a lot of problems with chemicals leaching out uh, on that because most of those trash cans uh, were made in China. And they don't care what they make things out of, and it's supposed to be a trash can, so you're not going to eat out of it, supposedly. So you want to make sure you have a food grade, uh, you know, uh, a food grade container. You're putting your your sap storage in, uh, either stainless steel um, um, milk tankers or something that's. All ours are dairy tanks. All our all our all our tanks are dairy tanks, so they're 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 certainly food uh, grade stainless. Mm -hmm. That's important. An ice storm. We had an ice storm four years ago. Did tremendous damage in our top tiers. Um, the trees are going back really well. They're they're responded to it. Some of them we had to take out. It just it took them out. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of things that can happen. Um, like the wet snowstorm we had in October, the damage down there. We missed that here, but they really got busted up down down uh, south of us. So it, it that's something you worry about all the time. You worry about. Um, Tornadoes. You worry about downbursts and and um, you know hurricanes. Hurricanes can rip a sugar bush up pretty good too, depending on how hard you get hit with it. Uh, the floods we had last year from Irene, we were pretty fortunate here, but I got some friends in Vermont that lost a lot. Um, some people lost their whole sugar bushes. They just slid slid down the side of mountains. It was incredible. Mm -hmm. So that's what you worry about too. You know, is that's probably the thing we we can't control. Right. So you do can, you have insurance on nope. your sugar? Oh. It's not worth having it. It's you get so little out of it that um, it, it's not worth having it. We we did get some money from when we had the ice storm. There was a federal, um, I don't know whatever, it was a grant or whatever for for farmers that got beat up from that. Um, so we were pretty pretty fortunate. Um, it's it's it was a help. It helped us get a lot of cleanup work done, and uh, basically I, I'm breaking even on it. I looked at that money in the beginning. I thought, boy, that's a lot of money, but by the time we bought diesel fuel and labor, myself and another fella, uh, figure your time and everything, chainsaws, a whole nine yards, um, brush chopper, all that, it's, it's gone. <laughs> and are there things that people can do to improve maple syrup production over a long period of time or ensure sustainable yields over a long period of time into the future? I think we're doing that now. I, I really do with the, with the vacuum. Uh, vacuum is the single easiest uh, way to make more money in this business. End of story. It's a lot of work getting it all put together. It's an expense, but generally a vacuum system will pay it for itself in one season. Uh, it's that, that, that high a, 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 of a return. Um, it, it's, it's better than money in the bank. It really is. It's, uh, we, we've, our production has been way higher. It's, and they found, Cornell's found it's better on a tree. High vacuum is better on a tree than no vacuum. Um, the tap holes clean, uh, our, our staining in the wood is, is less. Um, and the trees seem to respond to healing much faster from the wound of tapping. So uh, I, I think that is the single most important thing in the production of maple syrup right now is vacuum. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, are there things though that you that people can do either plant more maple trees or um, they're pretty good at in planting terms of themselves. Supporting the trees. Um, you kind of leave it up they, to the tree. It, it, well, there's there's I like to do some of it. I, I really would. I got a, a backhoe now, and I'd like to do some transplanting. Mm -hmm. Uh, they don't respond to it very well unless you're really careful about how you you got to be very careful to get all the root ball. Maple are very easily disrupted mm -hmm. and they don't respond well to it at all. Mm -hmm. um, we've been fortunate enough to where, like I said, our trees seem to be seeding themselves pretty darn good. We got to actually thin them sometimes. There's too many of them, uh, which in the maple industry is, isn't great either because um, you want a good crown on your tree. We don't have a lot of great crown trees here. We got some on our, along our hedgerows that are nice, but for the most part, they're woods trees. So they're they're poles with a top up top. So there's there's not a lot of crowned out trees in our forest, and that's also why we don't run a super high sugar content. Um, I have one little sugar bush up the road here. That's it's it's like a park, and those trees run consistently three and a half to four percent every year. Mine are usually around two two and a half. That's average. This year we're a little below average. We're about 1.7. Uh, we've been pretty consistently staying there. 
So um, that's also another reason why uh, it's, it's uh, the old timers planted trees right along the fields and roads because they knew that they crown out and they, the more leaves, the more sugar they make. That's mm -hmm. photosynthesis, that's, that's how it's done, so. So if the climate continues to warm, you know, we are facing global warming, uh, what do you think will happen to maple trees in this area? I mean, I've heard they're kind of gradually going to move north. but I, I've heard this, and I, I, I don't believe a lot of it. I think it's, uh, it certainly won't happen in my lifetime. Um, I, I've, I had years back in the 80s where everybody said, oh, it's, the end's coming, we won't be sugaring anymore. And some of my best years were in the 90s. Uh, big snowpacks. Um, you know, this has been a very strange winter. It has nothing to do with global warming. Actually, it has more to do with, with the dying La Nina, uh, which gave us a great season last year by the timing of when it was. La Ninas and El Ninos can really hurt you badly, uh, depending on when they start and end. And right now, we're in an ending cycle. We're transitioning uh, to a to possibly even a, even an El Nino pattern. Uh, somebody, uh, I was listening to this guy the other day, some long-range weather expert, and he said we could have an Arctic summer, uh, a very cold summer, uh, which will mean bad crop yields for the, the farmers make, grows and growing vegetables. So um, it will be too late for us because our season will be over. But uh, it leads me to believe next season could be some kind of a year um, because of, of the, uh, the difference in the climate that we'll probably be seeing next year. But to try to forecast that far ahead, no one can. And what do you, what do you think? What do you predict will happen with maple syrup prices going to the future? Or I mean, I, I've noticed it steadily climbing, but you're saying it depends on. I think it's gonna. I think it's we're, we're at a high. Uh, if anything, I think we're gonna see we're gonna see prices dropping some. But that's gonna that's gonna depend on what this season brings. Uh, as far as I knew. Last week, Canada hadn't made a drop of syrup yet. It's been too cold. So they're getting pretty nervous up there. Here we are, we're heading into March. Uh, they could end up with a very, very short season. And if there's the crop is, there's about, as far as I knew, there was about 10 million pounds left over from last season in Canada in the, in the, in the reserves. Uh, so if it's a poor crop this year, that's not a lot of backup it could drive the prices up like it did in 08. The prices just went berserk in 08, it was nuts. Um, we tried to hold the line because we felt that if we didn't, um, we'd be hurting ourselves and a lot of guys had to backtrack. They went nuts and we're getting $80 a gallon or trying to. And um, now you'll see their prices uh, are down to more reasonable $50, $55. $50. Pretty much around here is about the going rate for syrup. There are people selling it for less that don't realize how, how hard it is to make it apparently and, and how much goes into making it. Uh, it's a tremendous amount of work, tremendous amount of investment in equipment um, to make this product. And, and I don't think a lot of people, the consumers certainly have no clue. They think, oh my God, it's a lot of money. They have no clue how, what it costs to make the product. Uh, all the equipment is either stainless steel or uh, plastic. And we all know plastic is oil driven. Stainless steel is, is driven by, by uh, markets right now. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the foreign countries are using stainless steel, so the prices are going up. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's the way the, the way of the world right now. So that's, that drives the price of syrup. Uh, and a lot of times we don't have the ability to say, oh yeah, I'm just gonna charge more for my syrup because if everybody's at a, about in the same place, you can't be the guy to say, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to get $100 for my syrup because I think it's worth it. Well, you can try, and you might. You'll, there's, there'll be people who will pay that money, but um, it's, it's, not, it's not the norm. Mm -hmm. And do you think, I mean, if, you know, hypo, you know, theoretically or hypothetically, say the maple trees head north and this area no longer has enough maple trees to tap into, would it be possible or would it make economic sense? Are there any, are there other types of trees that you could tap and boil oh, syrup they, people, and make? People in Alaska make, syrup? make uh, maple syrup, uh, not maple syrup, they make um, birch syrup. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have maple trees there, but they tap. We actually have a dealer, a uh, fellow dealer that sells sugaring equipment in, uh, in, in Alaska. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, there's uh, pretty much it's red maple and, and sugar maple here. Um, you know, I guess people do make syrup from ash trees too. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, here they, they make some kind of a, of a syrup, but um, no, it, it, it won't happen in my lifetime. Uh, you won't see this happen. This, this, I mean, it's, there's, we, we got uh, dealers down in Virginia, West Virginia, that are they're still they're sugaring mm -hmm. and they're selling equipment. So it's, uh, West Virginia is a long way south of here. I'm not mm -hmm. too worried about it right now. Mm -hmm. I'm That's more true. I'm more worried about um, other things as to where where we're we're going as far as um, um, you know pollution and all that kind of stuff. There's there's a there's a tremendous amount of salt and stuff dumped on this road, and I'm watching the trees. We've lost a lot of trees and on our, our our upper bush from it leaching into the, into the um, off the road. All right. um, and it's uh, the, it's the calcium uh, calcium chloride that's doing it because what it does is it dehydrates the tree. The tree can't pick up, it gets a big shot of this in the spring when all the snowpack melts and the tree's thirsty, want to make leaves, so it's sucking up all this stuff and it just shuts the tree right down. It, it just dehydrates the tree is what it does completely mm -hmm. and the tree dies. It, it won't happen in one year, but it, 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 over several years of dosing and depending on what kind of winter we have, how much of this stuff got dumped on the road. Mm -hmm. uh, this road's horrendous here because it's a state road, they just pound it. It's amazing the amount of chemicals they put on this road. Um, there's no fish left in the river down here. I used to go fishing when I was a kid and come back with my 12 trout every time. Now there's nothing. You don't even get a bite. I brought my kids and it was, I couldn't believe it. And I hadn't been fishing in years. So a lot's changed with that and, and no one seems to want to listen. I've talked to state representatives about it and you might as well talk to a piece of wood. Nobody seems to get the idea that Oh, well, you know, people got to be safe. Well, maybe people shouldn't drive 80 miles an hour on the road in the middle of winter mm -hmm. and realize that they're going to have to drive slower or we won't have any trees left. Mm -hmm. All the conifers along 91 are dead from the salt spray going in, into the woods. We found it as far as 200 feet into, into our lower sugar bush because mm -hmm. the cars are going so fast and if the wind's blowing from the north, northwest, it just picks it up and it carries it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I never had an idea how, how far it did carry a long ways. So that's something that I really tried to work with these guys to try to get it to at least be slowed down and it falls on deaf ears. Mm -hmm. That I'm more worried about than anything right now. That and of course the, the, uh, the Asian beetle, if that ever gets here, we're done. Mm -hmm. we're, out, we're out of business. So they've got it corralled down in Worcester, but who knows? Mm -hmm. It was there a long time. You know, someone could have picked up a piece of firewood from Worcester and has a camp up in New York State somewhere. That's mm -hmm. all it takes. That's true. So I was reading, so it's interesting, historically, uh, during the Civil War, abolitionists used maple syrup in place of sugar since slaves were used to produce sugar down south. Correct. Uh, do you ever see maple syrup taking the place of, I know we, I'm assuming we get sugar shipped up from South America uh, as well as you know, India and China. Do you think maple syrup would ever be used to replace sugar again in the future or if prices well, go up too in, high? Well, in, in, in kind of, in, it has. Um, I, a lot of our customers will not eat processed white sugar. We also have granulated maple sugar, which is basically like brown sugar. Um, it has a little bit different flavor, obviously, because it's made with pure maple. Uh, I don't. Uh, no, I, I think it's going the other way. I think we're. I think we're tromping them pretty good. Uh, it's being put in a lot of products. Um, there's uh, several companies right now that are making. Um, they're making maple uh, spritzers. Uh, they're like a soda. Um, I got one uh, guy that I sell to. A, he makes. Um, he has a, uh, uh, a soda. Um, ice cream they make ice cream and they do the maple with the ice cream I told him about the soda and now he's making the soda and he's trying it uh, Keith hi uh, this is Henry uh, you had mentioned uh, the word osmosis Can you tell us a little bit what that is and how that's affected um, your life in making syrup and would you be making syrup today if that had not been invented I, I can, and, and where is that going in the future even, the next technology? I'll tell you this, I, I, you're right, I wouldn't, I probably would, I would have, I would have canned it because the, uh, before we had an osmosis machine, and it's before we actually had the steam away, which, which is, is a, basically like a double boiler, um, we were going through 60 to 70 cords of wood a year. 
Uh, so you can put that into your into your eye eye of thinking of how much work it is to get that much wood together for one season to make maybe eight nine hundred gallons of syrup. We got the steam away. We cut our wood produ our our wood use down to forty cords a year, which my wife, when she met me, thought was still I was nuts. So um, her her parents lent us some money. We bought our first IRO machine. That particular year was a, was kind of a poor year, so it wasn't a good one to gauge on. But we only burned ten cords of wood. Uh, my average now is about 12, 14 cords of wood. Last year we went through more, but we've we've changed, we've revamped, we got rid of our steam away, and we're we're actually concentrating to a higher level now. We're going about uh, 12 to 15 percent, which we're taking out more water, <clears throat> so there's uh, a lot less uh, concentrate uh, sap to boil. You've concentrated it even more. So <clears throat> that way you're, you're burning less wood, uh, less time in a sugar house. Um, I don't want to spend my time in a sugar house. I want to be in the woods. You make your money in the woods, not in the sugar house. Um, it's, it's how good your vacuum system is, finding your leaks, um, making sure all your taps are tight, your vacuum's high everywhere in your bush. And um, the osmosis machine is probably the most incredible tool to the sugar maker, especially guys that are running oil, fire rigs. Um, it, it was killing them. Uh, even even uh, the, well, what, the, one of the owners of our company, uh, Jean Marie, he uh, they set 85,000 taps uh, in Quebec, and his oil bill uh, before he put in this new evaporator was uh, $60,000 for oil. Um, even with running high high vacuum, he was running um, um, very high concentrate with his RO. Um, still, uh, it's 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 a big big factor. The fuel is a big factor. You got to cut the wood, or you got to you got to you got to burn the oil to make the syrup. Um, but what I heard this year, and it's it's kind of interesting. We're going to go back where we started. Um, originally, evaporators were flat pans um, with dividers, and uh, you'd actually tip the pan up to get the syrup to run to the edge. And so much syrup was burned years ago, it was incredible because you'd have to get that tipped up and get the syrup out, lay the pan back down and quickly flood it over a fire before it, it, uh, it caught, on, uh, caught the, the syrup, scorched the syrup. So it was, it was quite, a, quite a challenge, but um, we're heading back to that, uh, not to that crude way of doing things, but um, they're talking about having an IRO in the next three years that will be able to bring concentrate to 30%. Um, so my, my little 15% is, is a joke compared to what these guys are trying to achieve. There's guys right now that are concentrating to 22, 23%. Um, so it's, uh, it's fascinating. It's where we're going. It's going to save a tremendous amount of energy uh, by doing this. But what I see being lost will be the maple flavor. Definitely. I've had some of the syrup from these guys that are really concentrating, and it has no flavor. Uh, the searing uh, of the sap, uh, while it, it's being uh, boiled, and the length of time it spins in that evaporator is what creates the flavor. Um, and after 15%, you start to lose that. And that's why we chose to go only to that point, and we're going to stick with a conventional flu type of evaporator uh, and let everybody else do what they're going to do. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing in some respects because um, if we need really light syrup, we can blend in some really light syrup to kick some of ours up a little bit that isn't right on, on where it should be. So for me, I see it as being a, a blending agent. Uh, it'll be valuable as a blending agent, but to put it on my pancakes, no. Uh, uh, Keith, um, I know the industry pays more money for lighter syrups, uh, earlier syrups. <clears throat> some people actually prefer the darker syrup which comes when the buds come out. It's late your, late, your late, late in the season. Uh, what's the taste difference and what, what's happening there? Um, that, that was true and uh, it, it's changing rapidly. There's almost no price difference from the worst garbage we make and I don't mean that we make garbage but at the end we're making commercial syrup usually. I didn't make any last year. It just stopped running. Um, but the Lightest syrup is the most delicate flavored. It's preferred uh, by um, by me. <laughs> My wife won't have anything else. It's it's really the best. For, it, you have to have it to make candy and cream. 
it, it, it won't happen otherwise because what happens is basically to think about this in a simple way there's right and left sugar as you get more towards the end of the year it starts turning it, 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 it's it's invert sugar is what it is so you got you got one type of sugar working against it it won't crystallize you can you can cook it till the cows come home and it won't it won't make maple candy and it'll be an undesirable color even if it does crystallize it, it won't be that night light uh color that that people like and i like it's 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 the delicate flavor and you've and you've taken that delicate maple syrup and you've 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 um, you've concentrated it even further to make candy so you're also concentrating the flavor and that's what gives you that nice maple flavored candy where the syrup would be very very delicate you couldn't taste a lot of flavor in the syrup i've made candy from syrup i've bought from different producers and it's super super light but it makes fantastic candy um, as you get further into the season number one the weather's warming so bacteria growth is 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 coming on um, the tubing is getting dirty because it's had a lot of sap go through it and the sunlight and everything on it um, and also the trees are changing you're thinking about making leaves so they're going through a metamorphosis basically of of the and the sap becomes more acidic as you get further into the season the sap gets more and more acidic and you'll see less nitre build up on your pans um, and you know that you're you're nearing that that end of things the other thing that creates the, the darker flavor uh, uh, darker syrup also is realize that up until we had an osmosis machine now there's less and less sugar in that sap as this is happening the the bacteria is feeding on the sugar the tree is make is is basically got less sugar uh, reserves because it's sending it up to the leaves and your so your sugar content in your sap keeps dropping i've seen it as low as one percent at the end of the season sometimes even below that so basically it's like water there's almost no sugar left so if you're on a conventional evaporator, you're boiling and boiling and boiling and boiling. Geez, I'm not getting any syrup. And it's getting darker and darker and darker. And, and that's, uh, years ago, to be honest with you, there was no such thing as B-grade syrup. Even dark amber didn't, didn't exist because, number one, you boiled with buckets. You had about a three-week window. Now, and so your sap was, only flow was a very short period of time because the taps would dry up and also you had buckets and you didn't have the bacterial growth in the buckets that you do in tubing okay so to, basically dark syrups have been created by tubing um, and the uh, uh, it's it's good, trending away from that now because we're concentrating to such high levels as you can see we're looking at some of the syrup we've made it's super nice light syrup we will make darker syrup it's inevitable it's going to happen no matter how how high you concentrate um, also by concentrating it a really really uh, lean sap it also the osmosis machine by it circulating back and around 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 in there it's getting warmer so now you've you've concentrate also when you're concentrating with an RO you're concentrating all the, all the bad stuff too the bacteria you have concentrated and everything so now you just shot all this stuff into your tank full of bacteria and it's warmer now because the sap coming in is warmer I've seen sap as high as 17 centigrade coming into the RO and have it kicked up even uh, as much as two centigrade before it leaves the RO and goes into the tank. Now you're boiling sap that's really full of bacteria, and you're going to make dark syrup from it. End of story. It's going to happen. So every do you have a process where you have you clean the tubing once yep. a year, or we wash oh, the tubing. how do you do that? We vacuum wash all our tubing. We used to pressure wash it, but we've gotten so many boosters in our system now to boost the vacuum that it's just not feasible anymore to, to, to wash with, with, um, uh, with, with pressure. And also we've switched our cleaning agent to hydrogen peroxide um, and are getting really, really good results. Um, we were using a non-chlorine based, basically an oxygen shock before, which is the same thing they put in swimming pools, um, and had fairly good results, but we're getting phenomenal results with the hydrogen peroxide. It was okay by the FDA. It's, we're ready to go, and we've, we've used it two years now. I was kind of the guinea pig down here from the company to try it. Uh, they were using grain alcohol for a while. Um, that tends to be an issue for regrowing bacteria. Even though it kills the bacteria, it's, it becomes an agent to start growing bacteria. And what's wonderful about the hydrogen peroxide 
is it once it's done its job, it turns to sterile water. So all my drops, I used to get a little bit of green in them after washing. I have to, what I realistically did was go back through my woods and dump all the water out of every single drop line. So you can imagine, you gotta go through 8,000 of these little lines, taking them off and draining them. We don't have to touch them now. We wash them. All we gotta do is go out and collect the drop lines and bring them in at some point in the year. But we don't have to go out. It's, it's one step being taken out. Plus it's, it's made uh, the tubing uh, a, mu a much cleaner uh, environment uh, than, it, than it was uh, before using it. I'm very, very pleased with it. Mm -hmm. And Keith, are you able to harvest enough wood to burn for making maple syrup? I, from I, your I have more wood or? than I know what to do with it. It's, it's, um, yeah, from going from as much as we used to burn to now, we, we got more wood than we know what to do with it. It's, uh, and we, we pr primarily burn hemlock, mm -hmm. hemlock, some pine, some hardwood. Um, mixed in, but primarily the hemlock, because we're getting the hemlock out of the maple stand. Uh, it's, it's no friend of the maple tree. It, it's detrimental to a maple stand. Um, it'll, it'll choke out the lower limbs on a maple tree, and the, the limbs in time will, you can, I, I've actually seen it in the woods where I've cleared out in 10 years, all of a sudden where there was a big knob where there once was a limb, now there's a nice little limb growing right out. And the tree will just, will just take right off. Some of them will just take right off. It's amazing um, to, to see how they'll just, wow, we got light finally. I, I, and maple are sun worshipers. They got to have water, but they love sun. They, they really are total sun worshipers. So uh, the more sunlight you can get into that sugar bush, and that's why we call it a sugar bush. You, you try to keep as much other stuff out of there as possible. Um, the other thing we found out that we, we got as a competition tree, which I don't care for them very much, but we found that commingling of the roots is a beech nut tree. Some reason, they haven't figured out why, but the maple trees where beech are growing, and I've actually discovered this on my own, my own sugar woods, um, where I got beech mixed in, my trees are happier. They just, they just good, they're good friends. Um, so, yeah, that's, a, that's another thing that, that really um, is, is important, and, and I'm telling guys to foster it, let them grow. Um, you know, you can cut the bigger ones down, but beets tend to regenerate from the ground. You, you cut one down and 50 come up, they're, they're just amazing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I find that as being very beneficial um, to, to sustaining the, the, the forest. Uh, but yeah, we, we produce more wood than we can burn. Mm -hmm. We really do, um, and uh, I, I wish I didn't have so much of it sometimes, but eventually I'm going to run out of it, and I'm going to have to switch over to something else or, or buy it in, but I may not. I mean, uh, you know, I'm only looking at maybe another 20 years doing this unless the kids take it over, mm -hmm. um, and it, it's not going to be feasible for me to, to be able to do it anymore, um, so I'll switch gears. <laughs> any other questions? Uh, yeah, Keith. Um, do you uh, make any uh, other products besides maple syrup? Yep, we make uh, maple candy, we make maple cream. Um, we also have a fellow who uh, makes our granulated sugar for us. Um, <clears throat> sometimes he uses my syrup and sometimes he uses his own syrup. He makes a very high quality granulated sugar, um, better than any of the commercial places where we were buying it in from before because uh, he's very conscientious of the syrup that he makes it out of. It's very important to get a nice uh, flavored, uh, um, I've, I've had it taste uh, rancid, I've had it taste uh, buddy, they made it out of buddy syrup. <laughs> so, you know, it's just, uh, there's no conscience for the big guys. They do what they want to do. But um, yeah, we're very pleased with that. And that's the different things we do. We pack glass, um, uh, mostly only maple leaves pretty much. We do three sizes of maple leaves. Uh, if somebody wants a specialty glass, if they want to want us to get it for them, we will pack it. Uh, but I don't, I don't keep it on the shelf. It, it doesn't sell well. Because what you like, someone else doesn't like. It's like, oh, God, it's a goofy looking piece of glass. But the guy down the street might say, oh, I like those banjos. Those are pretty cool. But if I, I put them up, they'd sit here on the shelf for 20 years and nobody would buy them, you know. Uh, so we stick with the maple leaf because maple leaf is maple. So people like the maple leaf. And we only do those by, by, uh, by order also. Uh, we don't pack anything below a pint uh, unless it's a special order because a uh, same thing who wants to come and buy a half a pint of syrup it's just not enough for a family mm -hmm. we find most people that come here to buy out of the house buy quarts and up 
because you're buying a gallon because they, they've got you know two or three kids and they want to eat maple syrup. <laughs> Once they've had the real thing, they don't go back. <laughs> so Keith, earlier you mentioned an association. Is that the maple sugar? There's a Massachusetts Maple Association. Yes, uh, we are a member of it. Uh, I find it, uh, we used to, well, the reason we were members at one time was because we got our jugs cheaper. Uh, that's not a good reason to be a member of, of anything, but that's why we did it. Um, we got our own line of jugs now we use. We don't even use our jugs anymore, but uh, I do support the organization. I was, uh, I was um, uh, on, a, on a board for uh, six years and then they, they got me off because it, you got you a six year term and that's it. You can do three and three and then you gotta take a rest for a year. And I've had a couple of years and I'm gonna, I may go back on at some point. I, I find I'm out of the loop when I'm not there. I, you learn a lot, you, you pick up, okay, where are they going now? What's the government planning on doing to us next? You know, and you get all the insight. Now I gotta call up poor Winton, the coordinator and ask him, hey, what do they got planned for us now? You know, and he'll bring me up to speed, but, um, yeah, it's a it's a good thing, and he's done a lot with it. I think he's taken it to a new a new step. He's a younger guy. Um, the old coordinator had been here a long time, and and he need, he needed to be done because he was he he brought us a long way, but it, we were just kind of humming along at the same level. And uh, the new guy is just he's kind of brought us to a new. He's got new ideas and trying to get the young kids involved. Um, we have little packages that, that a young boy is, or girl that's coming along, it's eight years old, it's interested in it, it's got a book, it's got uh, all kinds of things, where you can go to your equipment, uh, how to get started, how to tap a tree, all that kind of stuff. So it's getting the younger generation, because they're our future. If we don't educate them, uh, we won't have them out there, and some of them are, are, are really taken to it. Um, it's exciting to see them want to be out there learning how to do this because it's a it's a magic uh, it's a magic product it really is so Keith if any if any of the listeners would like to find out more about your syrup is do you have a website or we do is there a way it's to... uh, uh, Berkshire maple www.berkshiremaple.com uh, we can be reached there um, and my wife tries to check it pretty often but during the sugaring time it's uh, it's tough we're so busy running um, sometimes we miss a day too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have an email address, or? Uh, yeah, that's sugarmaker at msn.com. We're linked to a lot of different uh, different things, and, and it all I don't, our web guy does that. I don't know what he does and how he makes it happen, but uh, we come up very high. Uh, a lot of people. Um, we got a lot of work to do to our website. It's it's tired. It needs some work. Uh, we want to get the new sugar house on there, and we got the old sugar house on there, and we got some really nice pictures of our sugar house uh, sugaring operation that we want to get on there. There's a lot of old pictures from my grandfather's operation on there. It's it's an interesting site, but we want to make it better. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, a lot of people love it. They go on there and they say, "My God, it's a great site." But we've got my wife's got a lot of new ideas that she wants to try to put on there to, to make people find us easier or make it a little easier for them to shop around because it's pretty clear everything's on there. We have a wholesale page, we have a retail page. Uh, we don't do bulk at all anymore. We used to sell bulk but we don't buy, we, we, we buy syrup in but we won't sell syrup out on bulk anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we just got out of that completely since we've got into this whole new mode that we're in. Mm -hmm. So we're able to market everything we make which is pretty exciting. Yeah. So do you encourage folks to drop in here to buy syrup or would you rather them go to the website and oh, order? Oh, I have no problem with, with visitors coming here. Uh, we just don't, we're not open to the public per se during mm -hmm. the sugaring operation when we're making, we're strictly a commercial operation. Um, we're not set up for it. We're, we're in a tough location to get people in um, and uh, we boil pretty much at night. Um, I boil once during the day this year for some weird reason. I think there was a bad storm coming in or cold or something and we wanted to get the sap gone before it froze up. Um, so that was a particularly strange thing. It usually happens once a year I'll boil during the day and everybody around here is all like, because <gasps> they don't get to see me during the day. I'm usually out working my woods because that's where I want to be during the day, not boiling sap. A lot of people do it just opposite. They sleep all night and they boil all day, but they're not in the sugar woods. You want to be in the woods, and uh, that's what we try to do. So we usually start around seven, eight o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. It's generally, uh, it's been later. Sometimes things happen, or we're waiting for the run to end and freeze and get as much as we possibly can off that day. Because sap is a lot like milk. 
You don't leave a glass of milk out on the table and come back to it two days later and expect it to still taste good. Well, sap's the same way. You got to. My grandfather always said that. He says, boil it every day. Boil it fast. Boil it as fast as you can. Get it out. Get it done. And that's how you make a good product mm -hmm. that you can be proud of. Great. Well, Keith, thank you so much for joining us today to answer our questions about maple syrup production. Uh, we appreciate your time. Nice, nice to be with you.